Good morning, everyone. My name is DJ Betancourt, and I am the Commissioner of the New Hampshire Insurance Department. We are here this morning to provide Granite Staters with an update on what we know about the cyber attack impacting change healthcare. I want to level set with everybody and ensure that we all understand the background and the history of this event and how that is manifesting itself for providers and consumers across the state. First, to be clear, cyber attacks are unfortunately becoming a more and more common threat, not only here in New Hampshire, but across the country. It is certainly frustrating and disruptive, but unfortunately, no one is immune. This department has spoken in the past about the importance of cyber insurance and the reasons why the cyber insurance market in coverage therein has become so expensive. Uh, the reason for that is because these attacks are becoming more frequent, complex, and therefore more expensive. From my perspective, now is not the time to assign blame, but rather it is to share information about what consumers and what providers uh, should do and should consider as we go forward. And there will be a time later for us to assess how this happened and whether or not change and ultimately United Healthcare's response to it was sufficient. As it pertains to change, what we know at this point is this was a Russian cyber attack. The reason this attack has had the impact that it has had is because while change is a subsidiary of United Healthcare, several other insurance carriers utilize their services. So let's be clear about what change does. In short, Change provides a platform for medical providers of all kinds to bill insurance carriers, get prior authorizations, and manage prescription drugs amongst other services. In short, it is a back-end platform for all of those kinds of services. Because of this attack, those services are, are, are currently shut down, and as I said, not just for United Healthcare but some of the other larger carriers here in the state of New Hampshire, including Cigna, Harvard Pilgrim, and Ambetter. Obviously, it has had a significant impact to the operations and billings for hospitals and providers. A few weeks ago, the New Hampshire Hospital Association indicated to me that 50%, over 50% of uh, five hospitals in New Hampshire had their um, income uh, significantly impacted as a result of the cyber attack. The initial reaction from change in UHC was to instruct providers to engage in paper billing and to utilize a call center. We appreciate the fact that this is a real challenge for those providers. Uh, we understand that some of the workers I have never used the paper process in the past, so they're having to learn an entirely new system. Uh, beyond that, it is obviously an intensive and laborious process, and so therefore those operations are significantly slowed. There are two positive developments that I do want to share. The first is that Change and UHC are bringing on alternative platforms every day. They're bringing on new workarounds every day. So we are encouraging providers to please check the change in UHC websites every day to see what new opportunities are available to ensure that their uh, revenue streams are not, uh, you know, are not seriously uh, harmed. Uh, the other thing is that uh, UHC and change have indicated that within the next few weeks, the systems, some of the systems should be able to start coming back online. That is the good news. The not so great news is last week, my Deputy Commissioner Keith Knight and I partook in a meeting with officials at UHC and Change as part of a regulator panel with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. I would characterize the result of that meeting as being unsatisfying. There remain a number of concerns that me and my fellow commissioners across this country continue to have. A couple of those key issues are that the presenter stated that $1.9 billion had been made available as relief funds subject to reconciliation at a later date, 
However, they were unable to give any context for this number, such as how it compares to the payments that have been disrupted. And therefore, without that information, it is impossible for us to assess the adequacy of the response. I would say as well, we have heard from hospitals that the relief programs that UHC and Change have made available frequently contain formulas that are excluding a large number of hospitals and providers. That is obviously unhelpful. Secondly, uh, to what extent has PHI, or personally identifiable information, been compromised? Here in New Hampshire, we are obviously a state that values and protects privacy rights uh, very stringently, so that is, of course, a particular concern to me. Additionally, a number of questions were um, unanswered regarding the advanced payments. We obviously need to understand what they are doing for advanced payments for those providers who are in the most dire need. We also asked when will Change Healthcare be able to provide details on what is happening next and what will happen once the services are restored. What steps are they taking to improve their system to ensure that this does not happen again? As they start turning those systems on, what is the backup plan should some of those services be discovered to be compromised? We're still waiting for that information. And finally, and most importantly to me, is what is the situation with prior authorizations? And I have great concern here because when you're talking about prior authorizations, you are talking about the patient's ability to get critical services that they need. It is literally a life and death proposition. And while change has made uh, several changes to uh, their prior authorization system for government programs, uh, they have not, to my knowledge, made appropriate adjustments for the commercial market. And I think that there needs to be a plan put in place immediately to address that. So those are some of the concerns. What I will say is that the local representative of UHC here in New Hampshire has been phenomenal to work with. He has been responsive to department inquiries. He has made it clear that he will work very closely with us to address any issues that consumers or providers are having. And so that is the key takeaway that I want to leave with you this morning. And that is that if you are a provider in New Hampshire that is significantly struggling financially, or is unable to provide care to patients in a timely manner, do not wait or hesitate to reach out to the department. We are happy to be the conduit uh, for you to get in touch with officials at UHC and Change who can help you, uh, but there is no need for you to struggle uh, and suffer uh, when we have the ability to intervene and to help you. And so what we're trying to do this morning is to elevate that message and to make it clear that we can help you if you are a provider who is really under the strain financially of this cyber attack, or if you are a patient who is in need of dire care and your prior authorization is being delayed because of this attack, please, please, please contact us. And so with that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I have a quick question sure. about um, the numbers. You said five hospitals are particularly impacted. Yes. Is that because the other hospitals are not involved with the UHC? So everybody's payer mix is a little bit different. So what the New Hampshire Hospital Association shared with me is that, and, and I let me rephrase to make sure I'm specific on this. I don't want to have misspoken. There are five hospitals in New Hampshire. And of those five hospitals, 50% of their revenue stream has been disrupted. Now, I will say that I understand uh, from reading some news reports this morning uh, that there is some financial relief coming their way. That is obviously a very positive development. With the hospital seemingly in a better position, uh, my focus now turns almost exclusively to the smaller providers, those providers who do not have the cash reserve to float while these issues get worked out. They are in the most dire need. Uh, in some cases, I have heard from uh, some providers that they're really assessing their options as to whether or not they can continue to stay open, um, at least temporarily close or potentially permanently close. That is not the development that I want to see, especially given the fact that we are in a position uh, to get them in touch with some folks who can help them work through that situation uh, through advanced payments or other uh, financial relief. 
And are those um, located in more rural settings generally than the more urban settings? I don't know specifically, but I think logic would tell you that that's probably the case. You know, those areas of the state who have uh, less volume are, are probably more um, reliant upon the book of clients that they have. And, and if they can't get those uh, services processed, if they can't get the billing straightened out, yeah, those guys are most likely going to have uh, a significantly greater strain uh, than other providers in, in other parts of the state. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that piece with the smaller providers, um, just like what you've heard from them about how this has impacted their their business and also just who we're talking about here. Are we talking about family practitioners? Are we talking about independent mental health counselors? All of the just above. All of the above. Anybody who is interacting with the insurance carrier. So if you're in network with, as I said, UHC or Cigna or Harvard Pilgrim or Ambetter, uh, those are some of the largest carriers in New Hampshire. To the extent that that provider is billing any of those companies for services, they're going through the change platform. And that obviously is where the crisis point is as a result of the cyber attack. So we're hearing from providers across the board uh, that their um, ability to bill and to keep their revenue streams uh, going uh, has been significantly harmed. And is it um, that they're getting payments way later than they should, that they're just not getting those payments at this point? Right. What is happening? In some cases, they're not getting payments. In other cases, the payments are very, very slow because they're having to go through that paper process, which is obviously very time intensive, uh, and somebody's got to go through all of that paperwork. I mean, we're going back to the old school way of doing things. Um, you know, you've got to fill out the paperwork, you've got to email, scan, fax, however, you've got to get it over to the carrier or to, to change, uh, and that obviously takes time on, on their end as well. Uh, so in some cases, some providers just don't have the staff to do that. So they're assessing their options as to how long they can float, what their cash reserves will allow them to uh, to hold on to, uh, to hang on to, um, before they've got to start making some difficult decisions. And, and are there particular changes you'd like to see uh, United make um, for to address that issue with yeah. the smaller providers in Sure. I think they've got to revise the criteria for the financial assistance programs that they've made that they've made available. I think they've got to be more aggressive with the advanced payments for those smaller providers. Again, I obviously care a great deal about the hospitals in New Hampshire, but those entities tend to be bigger. They tend to have larger staffs. Uh, they're not quite in the dire situation that a lot of those smaller providers are. I mean. To your point, some of these providers are, are single practitioners. They're a one-man shop or a one-woman shop. You know, they provide the service, they do the billing, they, you know, pay the bills, they do it all. And to have this type of disruption, and again, for some of them, they've never engaged the paper process before. I mean, we've had online systems in place for a very, very long time. So it's a real challenge for them. So in some cases, they're not getting paid at all. And in some cases, it's a trickle. It's a revenue trickle rather than the steady stream that they've become accustomed to to be able to ensure that their operations are not disrupted. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what kind of data may have been exposed in this case? Financial, personal, um, you know, corporate, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't about. know yet. We don't know yet. And it appears as though change does not yet know. So that obviously is of great concern to us. They are cautiously optimistic, and I'll kind of just turn to Keith for a minute to make sure he heard the same thing. It appears as though they're cautiously optimistic that um, no significant uh, personal information has been compromised, but it appears as though they will not yet entirely know until they start turning some of these systems back on. Do they give you a timeline on when they hope to, to turn on systems? So in terms of turning on systems, uh, the timeline that we were given was broad. It appears as though they're going to try to start turning back on some of their systems for the prescription drug component of what change does sometime this week, potentially. And then over the course of the next three to four weeks, 
they intend to try to turn on some of the other systems. I don't know at this point whether or not they're going to be able to hold to that timeline. But if they are, that is obviously encouraging. Could you speak a little more, more about um, what you've heard from patients or about the impact on, on patients that this has happened? Sure. So our consumer division is obviously available and we're monitoring it very carefully. I've received a lot of outreach personally from some providers. Um, pretty even mix of people who are concerned about payments and those who are concerned about prior authorizations. Again, we've got a great partner here in New Hampshire in terms of the local representative for UHC. We've been able to triage those issues. I can't obviously give you uh, personal information of, of the individuals or the providers, but uh, thus far they have been responsive. But we know that a lot more people have been impacted than those who are just reaching out to me and to the department personally. And so again, the purpose of today is to elevate that message to ensure that folks who are in need of assistance know they can come here and we can help them. And can you just give a little more um, general sense of like the prior authorization issue, what, what kinds of care that, that may be affecting or holding up? Really across the board, anytime you need a prior authorization, there's the potential that it could be disrupted because that part of this system, of the change system, is currently not operational. So in those cases, again, the advice is reach out to the insurance department and you may be able to help connect them. With Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Those providers should be getting a lot of information at this point from change and from UHC, uh, but to the extent that they're not getting the information that they need to address their specific issue, absolutely come here. They can come here anyway. Uh, but if the information that they've been given is insufficient to resolve their situation, come here to the department and we can help. I guess look, looking ahead, I'm wondering if there are ways you think the state could um, be proactive and, and try and, uh, again, I know this is a national company, uh, international cybercrime it sounds like, but do you think there are things the state government could do in terms of policy to try and prevent these kinds of attacks or at least mitigate the disruption if they happen again? Sure. I think there are a couple of different things. In the first instance, we've obviously used this incident, this unfortunate incident, as an opportunity to talk with all of our carriers about what systems they have in place to guard against cyber attacks. And I will tell you that I spoke with a very large carrier in New Hampshire who said, we are evaluating everything top to bottom. Because as I said, unfortunately, these cyber crimes are becoming uh, more and more common. And as I said from the beginning, I don't blame Change or UHC for the fact that they were the victim of a cyber attack. You could take all of the rational, proactive steps in the world, and these things are just getting so complex and so innovative that they'll find a way around whatever system you have in place. Unfortunately, that's just going to be a way of life for uh, businesses of all kinds uh, going forward. The biggest issue is what is the game plan in place when this happens? What is the response when this happens? How do you, in, obviously in the context of what we do here, how are you ensuring that patient care is not disrupted? How are you ensuring that providers are able to get the uh, financial supports that they need so that they're not having to consider temporary closure uh, or other drastic measures that are going to significantly impact their operation or their ability to provide care to patients. The Attorney General's Office has a very robust reporting requirement uh, when these cyber attacks happen. Uh, that flows, it, again in this case, that, flew, that flowed into the insurance department. Uh, beyond that, uh, at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, we collectively are working on um, a process by which uh, carriers are going to need to file with us or, or at least provide us with uh, their action plan for what happens if they are the subject of a cyber attack and what are the basic preventative measures that they have in place. That's a long-term project. Uh, I suspect that as a result of this incident, uh, the work on that front is going to accelerate. What about the um, department, um, do it, uh, or whatever, uh, Department of Info Technology? Those guys are really looking at New Hampshire state systems, That's correct? Right. But they received a lot of ARPA funding, as I recall, 
to prepare and plan for these kinds of cyber attacks on the state's system. That's right. Are they involved at all with you on this, or is it just AG and you guys? It's just a, the Attorney General's Office and the New Hampshire Insurance Department as it pertains to this. Because as you say, the focus of DOIT is on ensuring protection of the state systems, and God forbid anything should happen to any of the state systems. What is the state's reaction uh, and game plan going to be? Uh, as I said, God forbid that should happen. But you're saying that this is some, this is the new reality. Um, it depends on whether you're a private company or whether you're your state government. You, you know, there's yeah. there's got to be a lot more. Um, That's right. Know, ways to get it. That's right. Beat these guys at their own game. One hundred percent. I've talked about this before again in the context of cyber insurance, which uh, way back in the day used to be kind of throwaway coverage. You used to kind of get it because it was really cheap and it was nice to have. Uh, what has evolved over the course of really the past decade and a half, is the recognition that this coverage is absolutely critical. Uh, and because these attacks are getting more and more sophisticated, because they're becoming more and more frequent, what was once very inexpensive coverage has now become rather expensive coverage. Uh, and there are fewer and fewer provide, uh, carriers who are offering that coverage. Uh, but what I've talked about, in, again, in that context is, uh, what is your cyber hygiene as a company? What systems do you have in place? Um, what is the game plan should there be an attack? Uh, again, you can put very solid protections in place and somebody somewhere, in this case it was Russia, uh, is gonna come up with some crazy, innovative, complex scheme uh, to get around the protections that you have in place. Um, you know, obviously, you know, it only takes one, right, in this case, and it really is, quite disruptive to the entire system of that company. Some of the most vulnerable um, uh, providers, I would imagine, were they going into this situation in a precarious position? And if so, what were the factors um, for that? Well, obviously, each business is in a different financial condition. What I will tell you is, is that if you're a small practitioner or if you're a practitioner with one to three employees, you're always right on the margin. Uh, you're offering a, you know, it's a vocation for these people to, to do what they do. They've dedicated their lives to helping people. Um, they're not out there to be millionaires. They're not out there to have large, robust companies. Uh, they enjoy the intimacy of the work that they do. And so, um, again, whatever their business model is, uh, they just don't have the financial cushion to withstand a long-term interruption of their revenue flow. Well, I know that we're talking to the governor about the state's um, prescription program for state retirees mm -hmm. and the problems that they were have, they are, I guess, maybe still having with um, Anthem. Mm -hmm. um, is there any uh, um, connection with that? No, Anthem does not use change for the types of back-end services that I described. Um, that, that, those sets of services are dealt with over at administrative services, not here at the department. My understanding of that situation is that there is a glitch somewhere in Anthem's system that is causing that disruption. Uh, that is not anything that uh, is a result of a cyber attack or anything of that nature. Are there any... Um tips, lessons, takeaways for individual patients, whether that's, you know, I don't know, should I have all my important health documents printed out somewhere? Are there things I should be doing to protect my, you know, private medical info or make sure it's not, you know, housed in too many different places? Just Absolutely. Individuals should keep in mind. Absolutely. About a month or so ago, I published an op-ed talking about the rise in insurance fraud. And one of the pieces of, um, one of the pieces of feedback, one of the suggestions that I provided to consumers is exactly to your point. Uh, be very, very careful with who you share your information with. Uh, obviously, you're going to need to provide information to your doctor and to your insurance carrier to make sure that you're getting access to the services that you need. Uh, but do not provide anything more than is required uh, and keep the number of individuals and the number of entities that you share that information with very, very narrow and specific. 
Um, the numbers that you provided on your press release um, for contacting um, the department in this case, um, is there a preferable way to reach you guys, either by phone or um, website, email? There is no wrong door. There is no wrong door to contacting us, whatever folks are most comfortable with. All right, so all three, I've got you know, the 800, the, yep. you know, the 2719, and the email, consumer services, and then the website. That's right. And is there stuff on the website specific to this? Uh, I do not know. We are in the midst of uh, a website upgrade. So as a result of that, they have asked us not to produce too much new content that's going to have to eventually be migrated over. But we will at least put one document on our website um, f pertaining to this situation in very short order. All right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.